So, as Lisbeth alluded to, uh, this is part three of a series that we've been looking at in terms of the spiritual gifts. Um, three weeks ago was Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday. We were looking at Pentecost power and what that means and how the Holy Spirit comes and empowers us, empowered the early church, the early disciples, and the impact that had. And then following on from that, we've then looked at the... Um, well, part of the letter that we now find as First Corinthians from the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth about spiritual gifts and spiritual things. So just to ensure that we're all on the same page, so to speak, let me just briefly recap, literally briefly recap. Um, First Corinthians uh, is the letter, first letter to the church in Corinth that Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote, not this Paul on the front row here, but the Apostle Paul. Um, I did go to a church once whose senior pastor was Paul, and he preached a whole series about Paul's travels around what we now recognise as the Holy Land, shipwrecks, persecution, everything. And there was a guy that had been, literally come off the streets, got saved, and he went along to a midweek group, and uh, they were saying, well, what are you making of the teaching series? And he said, oh, I'm just in awe of our senior leader. He's been shipwrecked, he's been persecuted, he's been stoned. He's come through all of that. But yeah, uh, that's great that you've really got hold of the truth here. But a different Paul. That, 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 that's Paul Reed, our pastor. This is the Apostle Paul that we're reading about. So, different Paul. So it's not Paul Wheatley that's writing to the church in Corinth. It's the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth. Which, as I said a couple of weeks ago, a bit like the equivalent of, say, Oxford or Cambridge today, a real cosmopolitan place of learning, lots of ideas, lots of philosophy going on, lots of new ideas in terms of creativity and the arts. Uh, it was once written, you uh, couldn't go anywhere very far without finding a wise man talking and trying to uh, espouse his ideas, pass on his ideas and thinking to people. It was quite a cultural place to be and lots of very spiritual things taking place as well. So into that context, in that kind of city context, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth about spiritual gifts and actually says to them, I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to be informed. I want you to know what God is saying to you about the gifts. And so we were thinking about the fact that they are grace gifts. We can't earn them. We can't do something in order for us to get the gift from God. It's a grace thing. And the key motivation behind all of this is not that we become gifted and try and have a, a competition amongst ourselves. Well, who's got the more, more spiritual gifts? How many gifts has Paul got and, and versus, uh, versus Pete? And, uh, and who's therefore the more spiritual? Nothing about that. We've got nine spiritual gifts that we should all be desiring to be using. And ultimately, it's about love. Love is the key. So these gifts are designed to show love to one another, love to the world around us, and to build the church up. And that's the love. And that's not just kind of a part of Paul's letter. It's very interesting. Whenever he talks about certain gifts, the love issue, the love factor, comes either before or after. It's something that he's constantly reinforcing and underlying. So we were looking at the gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, nine gifts, the Holy Spirit is resident in each of us, therefore we should all go for it, all nine. Don't be British, don't say possibly, I'll go for two, possibly three, but then four is just going over the board and I'm not going to be indulgent. No, go for all nine. The Holy Spirit is in you, he wants to flow through you, go for all nine gifts. Seek to be using all nine gifts. So we're starting to look at these. Uh, we could do a massive series of, on, on nine Sundays, we're not. So I'm drawing the conclusion of this um, chapter or, or, or block part and we'll come back and we'll pick up on the remaining three. But we've been looking at uh, um, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy, which I will briefly recap uh, very shortly if I get to the right stage of my presentation. There we go. What I wanted to highlight is this idea that although we have a, a list of nine, uh, very often if we think in terms of a list, it gets rather restrictive. We get kind of very boxy in our thinking, well, is that a gift of prophecy or is that a gift of tongues? I like to think about things as a spectrum and therefore there's some, a degree of overlap. And very often we might flow with a gift of faith that then leads to some healings, that leads to a word of knowledge, 
there's some overlap. So if we think of a, a spectrum like the one you see on screen, then we can mark along the spectrum gifts, spiritual gifts that impart the power to know, such as wisdom, knowledge and distinguishing of spirits, uh, gifts that impart supernatural power to act, like faith, miracles and healings, and then gifts that impart supernatural power to speak, such as prophecy, various kind of tongues and interpretation of tongues. So whilst there's definitely nine, there's kind of nine points along the spectrum of spiritual gifts, emphasizing the fact that they can overlap very often with one another. And so in recent weeks, in the last um, two weeks, uh, we've been looking at words of knowledge, that kind of sudden revelation given by the Holy Spirit of certain facts related to specific situations that weren't learnt through normal thought processes. So is there somebody here who's kind of injured their knee in a sporting accident or something like that? Sometimes that can happen. And an example like that is great to emphasise that overlap because very often if somebody responds, you can then pray for healing and see the gift of healing exercised. So there's kind of an overlap between the two. We looked at words of wisdom, uh, spirit-inspired insight into the will and word of God. So it's revelation from God, usually revealing how and when facts that are already known can be applied. So if you might be praying for a really difficult situation, great thing to be praying for, not only the people involved and for resolution, but as part of that resolution, Lord, pray for a word of wisdom. What, what, what do we need to be doing? What's the wise, what's godly wisdom in this situation to do and to act or to say? Then last week we were looking at the gift of tongues, essentially prayer in which an individual speaks to God, uh, emphasis on the personal, it's kind of a personal heavenly prayer language, which, as I said last week, could be likened to eating spiritual pasta. It builds us up like an athlete might eat lots of pasta before a race. Uh, uh, tongues helps to build us up spiritually in order for us to be strong in our spirits. And then when we have the gift of tongues, that heavenly prayer language exercised in a public setting, we need to have the interpretation of tongues so that an interpretation is given as to what's being expressed, what's being uh, said in that heavenly prayer language. And then we also briefly looked at prophecy last week. Prophecy, hearing from God and speaking what we hear to build up, to encourage, to comfort, and to exhort, to urge strongly. They're the three main aims of prophecy. And so we saw last week that tongues spoken in that public setting is as powerful as, as prophecy. Sometimes we elevate, I think, praying in tongues as being this really, really spiritual thing. Well, in actual fact, it's one of the nine spiritual gifts. It's something that we should all be exercising. It's not particularly more important than the other. With tongues, it's a way of building up the church and a sign to an unbeliever, perhaps coming in and, and being amongst us and recognizing that, hey, these, these Christians who, uh, who are saying that they believe in the Spirit, believing in the power of the Spirit, actually there's evidence of that because here I'm hearing them speaking in this heavenly prayer language. The Spirit is at work amongst them. Prophecy is distinct to tongues in a way that because it points to, uh, it allows believers and unbelievers to be pointed to God. Those who hear the voice of the Spirit are convicted when the secrets of their hearts, the, the, the phrase that Paul uses, have been disclosed and they're aware of the immediate presence of God and a profound sense of his glory and, and, he has, and his love and his interest in them. You know, God is alive and he knows all about me. Uh, or uh, to put it like one American uh, uh, puts it, uh, he's, he's, like, he's read my mail. There's a sense of, whoa, that was God. Who, who could possibly have known that other than God? And I have a personal example of that. Um, back in my home church in, in Colchester one Sunday morning, many years ago, I, I felt God give me a prophetic word for a couple. And um, I gave it to them publicly um, uh, in part of the, the meeting. And a bit, um, a couple of days later, I heard from the pastor that um, they met with a couple on other issues. And there'd been a sense from the husband that he was questioning the prophetic word. So obviously I, I was a little bit concerned. I thought, well, genuinely I felt that was from God. But um, if they're, they're doubting it or they're, they're cause for concern, I'm, I'm more than happy to be accountable to meet with them uh, and discuss. And so the pastor said, well, that's great. That's good of you. I have no... 
uh, issue to kind of uh, arrange such a meeting at the moment. Let's just see how things pan out. So the next Sunday, lo and behold, I'm walking into church and who follows me in? But the couple. So I think, this is going to be interesting. So we kind of exchange niceties and the husband, uh, oh, hi, nice, thank you so much for your word last week. I think, uh, kind of, inside I'm saying disconnect here. I'm thinking, that's great that you're now thanking me for it, but I've heard on the grapevine, more, more than the grapevine, I've heard from a, a, an appropriate source you're doubting it, but outwardly I'm thinking, uh, outwardly I'm demonstrating, oh yes, yeah, but, well, thank you, I, I'm, I'm pleased that it's been a blessing for you. Um, and it, it, it transpires, a long story short, that it was one of these situations where God had read the guy's mail, so to speak. What I had shared with them was that I saw them in an airport lounge getting ready for a flight, and there were still things to get sorted out, and he was getting particularly concerned uh, for his wife and wanting to make sure things were in order. But there would be a sense that things would be coming in together and they'd be able to board the flight. Little did I know but they're talking personally and privately with one another about a move to Scotland that the wife wants to make. The, the husband is rather concerned about the details and is saying, no, I really don't want to do it unless I get a word from the Lord. And then I share that on the Sunday morning. So I appreciate it. It's a little bit kind of, whoa, was that the word of the Lord for them, for me? Uh, it, it, it kind of read his mail. But it is what prophecy is designed to do. It's to point to God, to, to reveal the secrets of our hearts and to really demonstrate that God is interested in us. He loves us and he wants the very best for us. So this morning I want to look at prophecy some more and particularly an angle on that, how we hear from God. Because very often when we talk about prophecy, we're talking about hearing from God and sharing what we have with others to build up to comfort and encourage. And therefore, hearing God's voice is really key to that working, isn't it? If we can't hear, we don't discern or feel that we hear from God, then we're going to have a difficulty in, in prophesying. All Christians, I believe, are called to hear God's voice. Jesus said in John's Gospel, uh, chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep, my followers in many respects, hear my voice. And so we may not all be called to be a prophet, uh, kind of one of the, the gifts uh, of, of the Son, of Jesus, that we'll look at in, in subsequent sessions. Um, but we are, as the church, called to be prophetic and to desire prophecy. Um, sharing our hearts, our lives with God is of utmost importance to him. There's a, there's a special place in God's heart for spiritual intimacy with him. He desires to be intimate. I, one of the phrases I use is, is a, he's a God of relationship. He is, but of intimate relationship. He really wants to know us. He wants to walk in spiritual intimacy with him. And we see that through scripture, throughout scripture. But a couple of highlights for this morning. In creation, Adam and Eve walked with the Lord in the cool of the day. King David was a, a man after God's own heart, it's written. And Jesus was the full expression of God's desire and intimacy, uh, modelling the kind of relationship that God ultimately wants to have with us. So, question for the morning, how can we hear God's voice? To reassure you, at this point, I don't think I know of many people, I certainly can say this, that I've ever heard an audible voice of God speaking to me. Right. Matthew, you are doing well. Keep going. There's nothing like that or, word or anything like that. What I discern and what I sense is a prompting, a flow of, of what I believe and I've come to recognise as God speaking spirit to spirit to me. And I want to unpack that and share what I believe are four keys to really hearing God's voice. Based and well, taken from the book of Habakkuk. Who knew there was a book called Habakkuk in the Bible? It's in the Old Testament, one of the prophets. Habakkuk chapter 2. So if you've got a copy of the Bible with you, you might like to turn with me there, or an electronic version. Uh, it's not going to appear on screen, but I'm going to read it to you. Habakkuk 2, um, verses 1 to 2. Habakkuk the prophet writes this. I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the watchtower. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and how I may reply when I am reprimanded. 
Then the Lord answered me and said, write down the vision and inscribe it clearly on tablets so that one who reads it may run. I think there's four keys here that I hope will be really helpful to you in tuning in and discerning how God speaks to you, hear, how to hear the voice of God. Key number one, still yourself in the Lord's presence. Still yourself in the Lord's presence. Habakkuk writes or uh, says, I will stand at my guard post. Uh, the, um, King David, writing the psalm, Psalm 46, says, Be still and know that I am God. In such a busy, instant world, it's not so easy to be still. We're not helped or assisted to be still. We're, we're busy, we've got action, we've got lots of interaction taking place around us with family responsibilities, work, even social media, supposedly, whatever social media is, designed to engage, to interact with others. There's so much stuff going on, things vying for our attention. It's not always easy to be still. But it's important to ensure that we do make time to be still and be able to be still in God's presence. Many examples in, in scripture of this, but just one to highlight this morning, Elisha in uh, 2 Kings 3.15. Elisha is, Elisha is in real need of getting hold of God's voice and perspective, wisdom and revelation on a situation he's facing. And so what does he do? Well, in 2 Kings 3.15 he says, Now bring me a minstrel, and it happened when the minstrel, musician, uh, played, the hand of the Lord came on him. And very often we can use music to still ourselves in God's presence. We, we know that David also used music to quiet him, quiet him himself. And in fact, the Psalms are very much his prayers that are set to music. And so we can use, um, that's why we praise and worship in a sense on a Sunday. Not only to praise and exalt God, but to still ourselves in his presence. We can use Christian music to help us in that. We can sing our own song to God. Those of you that are perhaps not gifted in singing in tune may wish to do that in a private place so that the Lord can really enjoy the joy of that singing rather than inflicting it on others. But either way, use music and singing praise and worship to God to help still yourself in God's presence. There's that healthy tension, I think, between actively pursuing the work of the Lord and also spending time with the Lord of the work. And very often it goes against, again, our kind of cultural thing where we've got to be doing something in order to earn favour. Actually, doing stuff for God is great and it's necessary, but let's not um, over-prioritise that in contrast to actually spending time with the Lord of the work. It's important, therefore, to still ourselves. The Bible calls us to physical calm. Hebrews 4 uh, tells us there remains a rest for the people of God to enter into. The Bible calls us to focused attention. Jesus writes, uh, saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father doing. He's watching, he's waiting, he's focused on what God's doing and then doing it. For whatever things he does, there the Son does likewise. And the Bible calls us to let him be, of being still and knowing that God is God. A receptivity as well. Uh, abide in me, John uh, writes in John um, chapter 15. Abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Hanging out with God, connecting to him, being receptive to him. When we're thinking of buying a car, perhaps one of the stats that we might look at, one of the features is, well, it goes 0 to 50 in 3 seconds, or 0 to 100 in 10 seconds, whatever it might be. Take that example and put it into practice for ourselves. How quickly do we think we can go from 150 miles an hour, so to speak, in life, doing all of these things, to zero? How quickly can you still yourself? Come to that place of stillness. Amongst all the business, I need to take time to actually recharge, to be still now. How quickly can you do that? I think it can be a real challenge for many of us. 
and it may can fluctuate. I can be really still when things are going well, but when it's really hectic and pressurised and lots of things to handle, it can be really tough. Absolutely. Not a condemning thing, but I, it's a helpful question to ask ourselves and reflect on. How quickly can you come from whatever speed you're doing life at down to zero? What can be a stumbling block is this whole mind versus spirit thing. We looked about this about looked at this a little bit last week. Um, to receive spiritual communication, most of us in the West kind of struggle because we try and, and rationalise things. We try and put the mind first of our brains, try and process, work things out first. Rationalism uh, is often uh, used to describe that. We rationalise things. But actually when we seek to place the spirit in first place, we can realise that actually knowledge, ideas, inspiration, revelation can be transmitted spirit to spirit. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses 9 to 10 says this, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the very deep things of God. God is not calling us. He's never calling us to remove our minds and never use them. He calls us to be transformed by the removal. No. Calls us to, calls us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says this. Not the removal but the renewing of our minds. The mind is important to God. And it's not an either or. It's a, a both and. It's mind and spirit coming together. So being still. Still yourself in the, in the presence of God. First number. The first key. Secondly, recognise God's voice as spontaneous flow within. Habakkuk, to go back to Habakkuk 2, says, I will keep watch and see. God's voice is often referred to as rhema in, in the Bible. It's, it's this sense of a spontaneous thought, idea, word, feeling or vision that comes to pass. Now, we need to bear in mind that, mind, that thoughts from our mind are analytical, thoughts from our hearts are spontaneous, and so biblical meditation combines that sense of analysis and spontaneity. It might all sound very nice, Matt, but where, where does that actually stack up? Uh, how do you stack that up in terms of scripture and keeping in line with God's word? Well, if we look at uh, 2 Corinthians again, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5, it says this. For though, for though walking about in flesh, we do not war according to flesh, the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, pulling down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. Now often when we think of taking thoughts captive, we tend to instantly divide our, our thought life into two categories. Those thoughts that we need to take captive of why? Because the enemy, Satan, is kind of tempting us or, it, or origins originating from him. And then our thoughts. They're kind of the two categories of thoughts that often we carry in our mind. But actually, that's not quite complete. From this passage in 2 Corinthians, we see that there are actually thoughts and imaginations that will try and exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. So there must be thoughts from God that are present for other things to try and exalt themselves over those. Okay? So actually we've got three streams of thought. We've got our own thoughts, we've got the enemy th of thoughts, and God's thoughts. We might have always thought it was just the two, but we've actually got the three things there. We're tuning into God. We're a vessel that the Holy Spirit fills we are a branch grafted into a vine. We've just read those verses. It actually, if we're a true and sincere follower of Christ, this is here, it isn't me who is living, but Christ living in me. Galatians 2, verse 20. So if I accept that, that the spontaneous thoughts, the ideas that I didn't come up with, do not come from my mind, 
They either come from my innermost being where the Holy Spirit lives, lives, so God's thoughts, or the enemy. So we've actually got those three ideas. There's my ideas, thoughts of the enemy, but actually thoughts of God that we need to be recognising as that spontaneous flow. God is actually speaking to us. We need to tune into that. Now, how do we test that to ensure well, where, what's the source of those things that are coming to mind? Well, we need to ensure, as we were saying last week, it ties in with Scripture. Nothing prophetic, nothing in terms of what we feel God is saying to us, or is that God that's speaking to us? All of that should always fall in line with and align with Scripture. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15 says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be made sure or fixed. God won't allow something to happen without agreement. So whenever you hear with God, whenever you agree with something from God, the devil won't be able to do anything. And we see that being played out in the life of Jesus in the wilderness. Four days he was tempted, and what was the enemy continually saying to him? Did God say, didn't God say this to you? He's fishing for agreement. The enemy knew if he could get Jesus to agree, two or three three witnesses, a matter is fixed, he would be able to weaken Jesus. He couldn't, because there is power in agreement. And so likewise, when we're testing, is that God speaking to me or not? Okay, I've got a source. Let's see, how does it stack up? How does it align with Scripture, with Bible? The two witnesses are important. How else do we test spontaneous flow? Is this from God or is it from somewhere else? Actually, what have you been thinking about? What are we looking at? Have we got our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith? I would say, sadly, if it's a case of perhaps somebody who's been walking a little away from the Lord, uh, disconnected really, may say they're a Christian, but have not really been kind of following Jesus for a number of months or so, and they're suddenly sharing things, I'd be willing to come alongside them and say, actually, I'm not going to pass judgment on this. I'm just wanting to make sure, what are you focused on? How, how are things with you? How's your relationship with God at the moment? To make sure, what, what's the vision? What are your eyes currently fixed on? We want to make sure you're fixed on Jesus. And, that can, and if that's in place, then it's a pretty good alignment uh, to make sure, uh, and, a, and a helpful test to check um, what... You feel God is saying whether that really is God or not. Another key word in scripture that we come across that is helpful are uh, looking at this whole idea of recognising God's voice as a spontaneous flow is uh, pagar, P-A-G-A. Let's see on screen. The chance encounter. It's the Hebrew word for intercession or prayer. And it means to strike or to light upon by chance an accidental intersecting. So we've got two lines that kind of come across at that point of, of crossing. Um, that's kind of describing pagar. A good visual image might be to think about a butterfly, how it flies around, and you're not quite sure where it's going to land, but suddenly lands and then flies off again and lands over there. Butterfly is a good example of pagar in action. A biblical reference, Genesis 28, uh, Jacob has just been blessed by Isaac in a rather underhanded way. He's passing himself off as his hairy brother Esau. Uh, And it was an important thing because it was an important blessing that God gave to Isaac's father, Abraham, about blessing and multiplying his descendants. In fact, we've just sung it uh, rather coincidentally. So Esau was very, very angry that his his, uh, blessing had been kind of uh, stolen from him, so to speak. So Jacob is sent off by his father with clear instructions to go to Bathsheba and to kind of just lay low in a sense for a while. So if we pick up the story in verse 11 of Genesis 28, it says this, Jacob lighted upon a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun was set and he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillow and lay down in that place to sleep. And that phrase there, lighted upon a certain place. Go back into the um, original Hebrew. It's he pagard. He chanced, a chanced encounter. He lighted upon by chance. And we're told in the rest of the, the passage that Jacob had the best sleep he ever had. 
Paul, we're praying for a pagar for him. Had the best possible sleep he could possibly have and a powerful encounter with God. So Jacob pagar, there was a chance encounter but it was ordained by God for it it to take place. To take all this away, we need to recognise that actually God, how do I hear God's voice? We've got to recognise God is speaking to us and very often it's that spontaneous flow. It's where did that come from? I think that could be God. It's a good... Um, check if, uh, if I wasn't really thinking about that person but I've suddenly been felt to pray for that or I wasn't thinking about that situation and I feel that impression or feel a sense that God is saying that about that situation if it comes so spontaneously it's a good chance that actually that's the voice of God speaking to you I want to share a very quick example uh, I know of two people that were out uh, seeking just to flow in these things in everyday life they were walking down a street and they came across a homeless guy and uh, they just felt you know, prompted to, I think, take a drink to the, to the guy and just talk to him and uh, just befriend him, uh, just give him the time of day because sadly it's very often most people that are struggling on the streets are ignored uh, and, and overlooked. And as the course of the conversation went on, he seemed very open to be prayed for, so they prayed with him. And just as they were praying, it's just a spontaneous sense of God speaking to these two guys to share this word uh, with the homeless guy. Uh, along the lines of God saw the, the pain that he'd gone through in the break of his family, that um, they believed that restoration would eventually come, but God really wanted to reveal himself as, as father to this homeless guy, to reveal his love in a very deep and special way, that he was looking after his family in his absence, obviously he was estranged from them at that point, and that they were becoming a time of restoration. This was very powerfully, powerfully received by the guy, spot on for where he was at. But this one guy, the, the two Christians that were praying for him, uh, said a final thing as they were beginning to come towards the end of their prayers, just suddenly spontaneous sense of a picture of a robin reliant from only fools and horses. I think, God, this was going so well. Why are you now giving me a picture of Del Boy's three-wheeler? We banish you now in the name of Jesus. That's one of those things that are exalting itself against the knowledge of God. Down, down. Uh, He just couldn't get rid of it. So in the end, wisely, he said, look, I don't know if this makes sense to you, but I just see a picture of the yellow Robin Reliant from up to only fools and horses. I don't know if this means anything to you. The homeless guy who had been crying just burst into another flood of tears. But within a couple of seconds, he said, that's amazing. My estranged family and daughters live in Peckham. And those of you who know the Only Fools and Horses series, it's based around that area of London in Peckham. So you might think, well, how did that work? I don't know. Don't try and rationalise it. All I can say is testify to That's that spontaneous flow. Very often, these things, where did that come from? Very often, that's the voice of God, the flow of the Spirit, wanting to speak to us through the Spirit to share things that God wants to reveal to others. We need to honour the flow because it's like that chance encounter. It's like that flow of of water that we know water uh, very often symbolises the flow of the Spirit in Scripture. John 7.38 says, Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Where Jesus is and has been glorified and the Holy Spirit has been given to us. And it would be, as Jesus said, like a river flowing through us. So very often it's like, I know we've got DAB radio now, we need to tune into that bubbling flow of the Spirit uh, whenever we're wanting to hear his voice. It's like tuning the dial in carefully until we hit that right frequency. And this, on this final point of the flow of the Spirit, another um, word in Scripture that I think helps to really um, earth this for us is this whole idea of boiling up versus bubbling up. In uh, the Hebrew, the, the word for true prophecy is nabi, uh, which means to bubble up or to sing. And we see that in the passage in Ezekiel where um, the Spirit of God speaks to Ezekiel and says, actually speak to these dry bones. And in Ezekiel 37 verse 4, it says, and he said to me, prophesy or nabi to these bones. Say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now we contrast that with the Hebrew word for false prophecy, which is zed, which means to boil up. And 
And that we see in Deuteronomy 18, verse 20 being used, where it says, but the prophet who shall presume, or zeed, boils up to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or shall speak, even in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Leave that one there with you. Let's not go with false prophecy. Let's boil things up. Let's tap into that bubbling up spring. And, and that, does, that can sometimes happen. We might thought, this meeting's rather boring. We need to see the Spirit of God move in some way. Let, let's boil something up. We take our spiritual saucepan, so to speak, and think, well, Pauline's there. Uh, Pauline, let, let's try and boil up a word for Pauline. Well, Pauline's mo- moved into a new house, uh, you know, uh, trying to get settled, uh, challenges with family. We, we, we try and work things up and we could boil something up. Well, in our own understanding and intellect, I think Pauline should do this. We kind of could dress it up. We should try and boil something up as opposed to actually, okay, meeting might be a little bit quiet or boring at the moment. Let's tap into God. What do you want to say to whoever? and tap into that spontaneous flow of the Spirit and see something bubble up and flow up as opposed to boiling something up in our own effort and time. So recognise it as a spontaneous flow. That's one of the, I think, the big keys because I think once we begin to recognise God speaking to us as a spontaneous flow in our lives, that can be really uh, uh, helpful to us. So the uh, third and fourth keys are, are slightly shorter. Look for vision as you pray. Number three. Habakkuk says, He will wait his guidepost and listen and look for what he will speak to me. There are 383 references to dream, vision, or seer in the Bible. I think God wants to speak to us. I think he wants to reveal things to us. I think we need to be open to hear that. It's something he wants to do. And the Apostle Paul, to go back to our anchor book, to the church in Corinth, there's, I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual things. And on prophecy, there's desire, prophecy, and I especially desire to hear God speak to you for others and through you. The gospel accounts of Mark and John are very different in style due to their uniqueness, but it's still divine revelation and accuracy. And I think they're good examples of the fact that God speaks to us in different ways. And I term this, as others do, in terms of kind of prophetic languages. As we recognize the flow of God in our lives, God will, in a sense, as somebody said, God speaks like you talk. Sometimes we're, we're waiting for that ethereal, God-like voice to speak to us but actually that spontaneous flow within will actually flow through things that are natural to us so I work and write Uh, as part of my work I read and write an awful lot so very often God will speak to me through words and as I say here perhaps puns and misspellings and mispronunciations so Patrick isn't with us this uh, this morning I won't go into the detail of what I shared with him but last week when we were praying for one another I, I said to him, Patrick, God's just speaking through your name. Patrick, first two words, Pat, God juggled around and said tap. And there was something about a tap that God wanted to say to me and share with him, share with me through him. And then the other's part, trick. And there was something about there that God wanted to just use the analogy of a magician. Again, I won't go into detail, it was personal to Patrick. But that's how God sometimes plays and speaks to me through words. Others of you might uh, really enjoy being out in creation. I know that I love to go walking in creation and God will often speak to me through what I see. There's impressions. Sometimes people might feel, well, I was perfectly well, but then suddenly a sensation down my arm and is somebody here got a pain in their arm on the the lower limb and that can often reveal things and um, speak to people's needs in that particular context. So there's some languages there on screen and just because that works for me doesn't mean that Pete shouldn't go around trying, I want to try and I want to do that thing with words and letters. No, but actually Pete might be somebody, somebody who actually on his guitar might actually release something prophetically through music, perhaps. Let's be open to how God speaks to us. He will speak differently to us, and that's why it's so important that we're all desiring 
God to speak through us. And as a body, we can build one another up and encourage one another. I'm conscious that this might be very helpful to people. Um, My wonderful assistant, in the form of my wife, I should just say, any of the last three weeks, anything on screen that you want or would feel beneficial, would benefit you receiving, if you give Debbie your email address, I'm quite happy to send all the stuff that I've put up on screen over the last three weeks. Uh, I really do want to help people grow more in the use of spiritual gifts. Look for vision as we pray then, and then fourthly, journal, or write out your prayers and God's answers. Habakkuk says, then the Lord said, record the vision, um, the time, the season that the the, uh, the um, Bible was written, he said, record it on tablets so they can run with it. Journaling or writing out prayers and God's answers to those prayers offer a real freedom in beginning to tune in and hear God's voice. The Bible has particular books that I think demonstrate that principle of journaling. Daniel, the book of Daniel, uh, Psalms and Revelation. And journaling... Um, can be really helpful in beginning to uh, really hone in and tune into what God is saying and God's flow in our lives. It allows us to, it frees us to write in faith, knowing that actually as we write it down, we're writing it down so that we can then turn to scripture afterwards and see, well, let's look for our witnesses. Does this stack up with scripture? If I'm writing, as I think I joked last week, I now uh, feel God is saying to me, go round to your neighbour and take his BMW from him, for you have been a faithful servant and you are desiring and deserving of that BMW. Clearly, that is against God's word and it's it's a humorous example, but it allows you to write things down to then test it and bring it alongside scripture. And see, does this stack up? Would this indicate that this is God speaking to me? It enables us to develop that art of tuning into God's voice and receive kind of whole pages as opposed to just little phrases or sound bites that if we're just sitting, God, what are you saying to me? What, what are you wanting to say to me? It can be more difficult. We can write things down and receive more. It keeps our mind occupied. Again, we're saying our minds are important, but we're wanting to kind of prioritize the spirit. And by writing it down, our minds can be focused on writing things down as we're listening to God speak to us. It helps us to recall what God has been saying saying to us over a period of time. And also, as part of that, helps persevere when perhaps times are tough. I think it does... I used to hear God, but do I really hear him anymore? We're actually flicking back through my notebook of journaling. Actually, yeah, I I can. God God was speaking to me. I I remember hearing God say that to me. And it can build our faith and it can encourage us. I don't want to dwell too much on this, but I think it's an important point. Some of us may have heard about other things in other spiritual areas called automatic writing. This is not automatic writing. Automatic running, writing briefly is where a spirit possesses somebody and their hands start writing and doing something. I believe in that as being a very negative thing. I believe in it because I believe in the spiritual dimension. It's the wrong kind of spirit. That person literally is taken over and they can't stop writing bad stuff. This is not what we're talking about here. I can be journaling, and to put it bluntly, I think to myself, I really need to lose. I'll go off. I, in other words, have control. The Holy Spirit is speaking to me, but I'm in control. And that's a big key thing. The Spirit is flowing through me, but I have that conscious control, which we've seen from the beginning of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, is a real key factor. The Holy Spirit it wants to partner with us. It's not a case of a takeover and we lose that control. So journaling is about us capture, is, journaling is all about that spontaneous flow birthed by God in our hearts, then recorded in a journal, in a notebook, by your hand, freely under your control. Okay? Right. At this point, as we draw to a close, I want us to... Um, We've been praying for one another as we've uh, come to the end of these sessions over the last couple of weeks. What I'd like us to do is actually give some space and time for people to begin to journal. Now, um, I used an example just there about um, how I prophesied or shared something with Patrick last week. 
I didn't necessarily journal that. It came to me as I was praying, as, as you were praying for one another. So journaling is not the be all and end all. G- journaling is not prophecy, but journaling can be a helpful tool to help us. So the more I've journaled, the more I can be in a meeting praying for people and I feel actually that there's that spontaneous flow. If I wanted to write it down, I could, but I'm now tuned in enough that I can prophesy freely. So uh, journaling and these keys to hearing God's voice, I think, help uh, in so many different ways to help uh, allow us to dial in to the flow of the Spirit in our lives. So what I'd like us to do, rather than pray for one another um, uh, this morning, what I'd like to do is to give some time as we close to allow us to be still, to basically put, in our, put into practice our four keys. Still ourselves, I'll put some music uh, gently on in the background, to recognise actually God, be open to God's flow, the spirit amongst us. And then I'd like you, as Debbie comes round and gives you a, a pen and a piece of paper, rather than looking at a blank piece of paper, I'd just like you to write a question that you want to ask God. It could be, Lord, what do you want to say to me? It could be more specific than that. But writing a question helps to focus the mind. A blank piece of paper shouts back nothing. But a question helps to focus the mind. Actually, I'm looking for an answer. Allah Habakkuk's example. I'm looking, Lord. What are you wanting to say to me about this, about that? And then in the stillness, take some time to write what you feel God is saying to you. Now don't start going rational about it. Is that God or isn't that? Is that really stacking up? Just write what you feel. Because getting over that kind of block is very often the key, I found many times for people and myself, to actually, that's what God's voice is. That's God speaking to me and recognising that flow. So take a piece of paper and a pen as Debbie comes round. If this is actually a little bit more uncomfortable for me at the moment, please just sit it out, enjoy the music, enjoy the presence of God. But I would encourage you to take some moments now and to just begin to use these keys to hear God's voice. And I also pray and trust that you can take them away with you and continue to use them in your own uh, quiet times with God. Not to say that everything that I hear needs to be shared, but I did just want to, before we move into that time, just share something from my own journaling to give you an idea of how it can work. But again, I want very much you to tune in and I'm in faith that God will speak to each of us individually. But for my own journal, when I was a question that I asked God, Lord, talk to me about how I can become still. I feel God said this to me, Son, it's great to be with you and have this time together. You need to become still so that you may focus entirely on me. You can easily get caught up with the trials and the testings of the day, but I want to give you rest if you would just come and rest in my presence. Become still before me. A cheater waits and is still before pouncing on his prey and making directions to attack. So must you learn to be to still, to be waiting for direction for your life that comes from me and spending time in my presence. That's the kind of thing, uh, how journaling can work. Father, as we come to a close this morning, I pray, Lord, the truth and insight from your word that I've shared would have built us up, would have encouraged us, would have helped to bring a fresh understanding of of the importance of spiritual gifts and particularly what it is to hear from you. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God of relationship and you want that intimacy with us. I pray, Lord, these keys from Scripture that have been so helpful to me and others to grow in our ability to tune in, to recognise the flow of the Spirit in our lives. I pray now, Lord, as we take time to apply these keys, 
would you speak to us? I believe, I have faith to believe that your spirit is brooding here and wanting to speak to each of our spirits and to speak into our lives. You're wanting, wanting to speak and release revelation, words and encouragement to individuals here. I pray for everyone that they would still themselves. They would recognize that flow within. And as they look, they position themselves to hear from you that you would speak. You would give them words of encouragement and comfort this morning. Holy Spirit, come. Do only what you can do.